Welcome to the worship of First Baptist Church of Los Angeles. Today is the 31st of January, 2021. Come, let us worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth. Let us join together in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for your presence. We put our trust in you, and we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your son, Jesus. And on this day, we come to you seeking your presence and listening to you, Lord Jesus, and how you teach us the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that changes our hearts and minds and souls, the good news that reconciles us to you gracious God, and to one another. O oh Lord, may we follow in your footsteps. Gracious Lord Jesus, may we hear your word and apply it. May we be a people who follow in your example and learn and model your character. Lord Jesus, heal our land, heal our world, heal people in their hearts, and bring us hope in your presence and in your promises. All this we pray in your holy name, gracious God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through your Holy Spirit we pray, amen. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. That made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth, you created all for love's sake. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, 
As we begin to look at this new year and the new beginnings and the challenges that are in front of us and the many problems that seem to weigh us down, we need to go to God in prayer. Let us go to God as we pray. Gracious God, we pray for your healing in our hearts and souls and in this world. And we pray that we would turn to you each day, that take a step at a time, but turn to you each day and find that you are there for us. Whatever we may go through, whatever trials and troubles, whatever heartaches and difficulties and what we feel and go through, loneliness, discouragement, frustration. And Lord, you bless us with your presence. You cheer us with your countenance. You help us and give us strength, especially as we recognize so many times we are weak. Oh yes, we have strength, but we also recognize there are limitations and we need your help. Oh gracious God, in our hearts we recognize there's also corruption and times that we think or consider things that are not good for us, that we can be led astray and we need your help to stay on course and not be led astray by those who would deceive or tempt or lead us to places and to do things that are not right. Oh gracious God in our nation right now there are so many people who have been misled by the specter of power and, and thinking that they should grasp power those who claim superiority and racism. Oh Lord, may this not be. And Lord, for those who think so highly of themselves or think so highly of their cause that they can't listen to others. Oh gracious God, may we listen to you and listen to one another and re give reverence to freedom and the respect of all people. Oh gracious God, may we learn to be your people. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us for thinking too highly of ourselves. Oh gracious God, help us to learn way, how to love our neighbors as ourselves. Oh gracious God, may we listen to this message of your son Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount and may we learn that the mirror that he puts before us is so that we would turn to you and ask for your grace and healing and forgiveness and live new patterns of life and more importantly a new relationship with you and one another. Oh gracious God we pray for those who are going through difficulties with the COVID pandemic, each of us, and for your healing and for your help to get through discouragement, isolation, loneliness, depression. Oh Lord, we also pray that you would help with the distribution of the vaccine and further development. Oh Lord, may we take steps that would help one another. 
Lord, we do pray for our new leadership here in our country. We pray for President Biden, Vice President Harris, for the House and Senate, and for all who are serving in different capacities. And gracious God, may we learn what it means to be one nation, one nation under God, and no longer so divisible, but more indivisible. Oh, gracious God, help us to be on our knees and pray. Help us to be considerate and kind. Oh, gracious God, may we learn that prayer of your son Jesus who said, not my will, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray in the way that Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's listen carefully to the Word of God today. We hear from the Word of God from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 5. We'll be starting a series here on the Sermon on the Mount. What did Jesus teach there? Matthew chapter 5 to 7. And here as we begin this very first week in this new series, we look at humility, Jesus teaching humility, modeling humility. And in this beginning, we experience something in the Sermon on the Mount of the reflection of truth and grace. And the question is, where are we with God? And so really the focus of this series will be pure discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus in a corrupt world? And how do we face our own sin and corruption? Jesus brings a mirror of truth as well as grace in front of the people so they can see themselves and see the world in light of God's presence and he being with them and in light of God's truth that can change us if we're willing and also in light of what it means to be a child of God. So 
in this journey together in this Sermon on the Mount. We'll start today and it's going to go until May. And we'll really get into this teaching of Jesus. This teaching of Jesus is to change us. Jesus taught not just so people would be impressed. He taught difficult things so that we would repent, that we would believe and trust in him and trust in God and change our ways. In the Sermon on the Mount, there's a call to get right with God and to be right with one another. And if we don't hear this call and if we just go about our way, we've missed the whole point of why Jesus came to minister the message of God, reconciliation, redemption, transformation, new life. All of this is in the Sermon on the Mount and he begins with blessed are the poor in spirit and then he asks the question at the end, what kind of foundation do you have? Is your house, is your life built on sand or a solid rock? So I ask that question as you and I begin this journey in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's hear this word that comes from Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to go from verse 1 to 6 today. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. May God add his blessing to this, his holy word, through his very own beloved begotten Son, Jesus the Christ, the Son, who came to be our Savior. Let us open our hearts to that work of the Holy Spirit through his word. Amen. In our scripture passage today, as we get started with the Sermon on the Mount, we recognize that we live in a corrupt world and God sent his son Jesus into the world to save the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Indeed, Jesus came to bring us life, forgiveness, hope. He imparted the grace of God. He lived the mercy of God. He brought healing and he taught truthfully and graciously. And here we find in the Sermon on the Mount, he brings a reflection of what righteousness is and what it means to be a child of God. And as he presents this, it's clear that we fall short. It's clear that we don't measure up. But what is clear is that Jesus is the answer. And Jesus is the one sent from our Heavenly Father as the very Son with the Father from the beginning of creation. He came in the fullness of time so that we could be made right, so that God could fulfill this way of salvation, this personal way that we may come to know him. Jesus came in the fullness of time to fulfill the plan of God. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, we have the essence of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in his teaching. And in this message, in the Sermon on the Mount, we find Jesus laying out what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be right with one another, what it means to live according to the principles of God's covenant and commandments. We find Jesus fulfilling the law. And we find Jesus making it clear that we can't on our own be saved just simply by our attempt of good works, but by the work of God's grace in us. We are called to let our light so shine and be salt. And yet we can't just do that by our hope, by our will alone but by the work of God within us. 
by the transformation, by the bedrock foundation that Jesus can be for us. So the Sermon on the Mount is the essence and bedrock and substance of teaching from God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. So as we open our hearts to this word from Jesus, from God the Father, to people long ago and to us today, we see that it has relevance even more so once again. And we'll start with this whole thing of Jesus talking about humility. The need for pure discipleship and humility couldn't be greater. We live in an era of pretense, spiritual arrogance, and false pride. We have people who claim the Christian faith, but they don't live like Jesus. They claim to be followers of Jesus, but their heart and their actions seem to be far away. You can have lips that are close or say certain things, and it doesn't make your heart right with God. We need to be careful. Jesus not only preached to his disciples there on this hillside along the Sea of Galilee, but he also preached to so many different people with so many different needs and perspectives and different places where they were. This message of the Sermon on the Mount will challenge us, our false assumptions, our pretenses, our self-righteousness. Really, the Sermon on the Mount helps us recognize how much we need Jesus to be our Savior and how much we are called to follow his example and not rely upon our own wisdom. The wisdom of God was revealed through Jesus, and we find the wisdom of God here in the Sermon on the Mount. And it all begins in Jesus' message with humility. What is humility? And why is it needed? Because so many of us think too highly of ourselves. Or we try to justify ourselves or rationalize things. Many times we try to live in denial instead of accept or confess our need. Jesus gets right to the heart of many issues here. But our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, must begin with humility. And so, what is humility? Well, some people will say that it's not good to be humble. Oh, you're too humble for your own good. That's a misunderstanding of humility. Humility is an honest assessment of one's reality. And if one's reality is not in a good relationship with God and one another, then one must confess that. But if a person's not humble, they have a hard time seeing this, and they live with a distorted understanding of self and the world. Humility is that, a, is that willingness to see things as they are, and then having the resolve and will to ask God for help to change that. So let's take a look at what Jesus said here. And even before we hear what he said, let's consider his posture. Let's consider his way of presenting himself in a humble way. We read here in Matthew chapter 5, first of all, about the priority and posture of pure humility. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, okay, he sees them. And he, what is the key need that Jesus saw in the crowds? What did he see? He saw people who needed a shepherd, people who needed a savior, people who needed God, people who needed forgiveness, people who needed healing, people who needed to get right with God. Many different needs. Many different needs. Jesus sees us, and he knows all about us. The question is, will, be, will we be honest to confess our need before him? As we hear this word of his that will come through the Sermon on the Mount, as we read any of his teachings, we recognize that he sees us. The question is, will we acknowledge what he sees in us and what he will confront us with? 
Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Why did Jesus sit down to teach on the mountain? Now, I'm, so many times people portray Jesus as standing on the mountain. I'm going to teach you. <laughs> it's kind of the authority pose that a teacher will have if they're on. Imagine somebody up on the mountain teaching. Jesus sat down. As a matter of fact, it's thought that when he sat down, he didn't sit on a rock and look down upon the people, but instead, in order to be heard as well as to, to teach, it was almost like an amphitheater where the people were around him, even above him, but all around him as he was on this mountainside. He wasn't on the top, he was on the side. This also tells us something. He's on the side. He's on an incline. He's not on a settled place, but in our lives and in this time and place, he's teaching a message that will be unsettling. The question is, will you go down? Will you go up? Will you come closer to God? Will you, or will you choose to not hear this message? But anyway, Jesus is on this side of a mountain. And it's not that he was, in a way, sitting down and teaching up to the people and around to the people. His posture shows humility. The priority of Jesus was to present, to get through the people's hearts. If he teaches down to them, will they be as open? Jesus postures humility. He's not trying to set himself up in a way that might make people resistant to the message, he is right with them. Now who was there when Jesus taught? Well, we read further. His disciples came to him. So his disciples were there. And he began to teach them, and he said. So yes, the disciples were the primary recipients of his preaching here. But his disciples were composed not only of the twelve, but there was a broader group, around 40 or so, at some point. How many more there were beyond the initial 12? Well, we know there were more. But even then, of course, there were many more who were gathered who were following him. And there, at that place, as they're looking around, they're up where there's a nice breeze, and there's the Sea of Galilee, a beautiful jewel. Blue and turquoise and, I mean, the, the fields around, and it, the setting was magnificent. In the midst of all this beauty and serenity, there's Jesus in humility on a mountainside, sitting down. And he begins his message this way, and this, we understand that there are blessings in pure poverty, pure humility. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now this has been thought of many times as a controversial or radical or revolutionary kind of thing that he's saying here. Is he talking about poverty materially? Well, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, blessed are those who humble themselves before God and don't think too highly of themselves, but understand their need, confess their need, are realistic in their self-appraisal, who recognize not only their strengths, but understand their weaknesses. A person who's poor in spirit is somebody who has a heart that wants to know more about God. If you think so highly of yourself, you think you don't really need God, or maybe I could learn more about God for my own sake, then you, that's not poor of spirit. Poor in spirit means that you need God, and you need others. You recognize your need. Being poor in spirit is not a bad thing. It's the beginning of a very wise and open heart. 
toward God and one another. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. God's love is for those who have a pure and honest confession. We need to have a pure and honest confession of our need for God and our need for one another, but mostly of God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. We must begin with confession. We must begin with humility. God's grace is given for kingdom inheritance to all who recognize their need for God. All who will say, Lord, I need you. I want to know you. I want to receive a knowledge of you, yes, but also your grace, your teaching. I want to serve for your kingdom. And it all begins with recognizing that we are poor in spirit, especially if we don't know the living God, especially if we're alienated from God or one another. We are poor of spirit at that point. But on the other hand, being poor in spirit is a place to begin. If we think so highly of ourselves or try to assume that we have it all together, we miss the point of our need and our hope and the growth potential that exists within us to be children of God if we don't first come as little children to the kingdom. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, Jesus said about the little children. Well, let's go on. There are blessings that come from pure brokenness, and this is where Jesus goes next. Because we can know the healing love of God. Understanding that you're poor in spirit will lead you then to understand that because of this, we must let our hearts be open to God and open to one another. And there are moments in life that we are called to mourn. There are moments in life that we are called to repent, called to listen, called to change because there's a ministry of God's cleansing and healing that takes place. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It's no happen chance that Jesus moves from blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, to blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Because when one recognizes their need for God, it will go to the heart and we will need to express our good grief, our good repentance, <coughs> our heart for change, and there's a healing work of God. For they will be comforted. The first thing that God does when we confess our need, when we repent, or when we weep, is that God comforts us. Even in the book of Revelation at the end, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, God comforts and dries our tears upon our entrance into his eternal kingdom. There is a work of God's grace now and throughout and to the end, a healing work of God. For they will be comforted. There's God's ministry of comfort and restoration to all who humble themselves before God. And then we find that Jesus speaks about blessings that come from being open and available to God. And he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Those who are meek are open and available to God. The word for meek here is often used even in the sense of a horse that is able to be guided by its rider, by its master. If we're willing to be guided, are we willing to be led? Are we willing and loyal and devoted and committed to do the will of God? Are we willing to put God's will above our own? Are we willing to put self-interest aside 
to fulfill God's purposes. Blessed are the meek, not the weak, but the meek. That means being strong in the Lord, being strong in the Lord and of good courage and to do the right thing even when others around you may not understand, but to not only do the right thing, but follow the path, follow the path. Don't get led astray. One who is meek continues in the path of God's leading, his righteousness, his kindness, his grace, his truth. For they will inherit the earth, the path of grace and truth and salvation in Jesus Christ, the path of righteousness in Jesus Christ will lead us into the kingdom of God and to be agents and ambassadors of that kingdom here on earth. But there are many people who will go astray. We live at a time when people have been misled by different political leaders to believe conspiracy theories, to believe that they are justified to commit acts of violence for ends and results that they think are in congruence with God's plan. Indeed, there's a lot of confusion right now, and there are many people who are not meek when it comes to the Christian faith. They've been misguided. But for those who will inherit the earth, they, they will be following Jesus and his example. They'll be living in the principles of the kingdom of heaven, not the ways of the world, of corruption, dishonesty, distortion, deception, lies, all of those things. We, in following God through Jesus Christ, are called to be meek. Doesn't mean being weak, it means being guided by God and his principles, his word, and his Holy Spirit. Those who will inherit the earth will be true to Jesus and true to his teachings. I can't help but think of a Romanian doctor I knew back in Chicago, Solomon. He had he had to stay the course of his faith through much suffering in Romania, such that they even imprisoned him for sharing his faith and believing in Jesus as he was a practicing doctor in Romania during the Cold War. They put him in prison, but he held firm to his faith and in prayer stayed meek and didn't lose his resolve but also didn't curse but thanked God. And when he came to Chicago, he needed a place to stay, and God brought him into the mix of my life, and he stayed with me in, uh, in an apartment in Chicago for a year. And I got to know Solomon and, and how God had a wonderful testimony, but it was his meekness, it wasn't weakness, but a sense of being guided by God and strengthened by God, that he could find God's help as he would pray and God would help him to overcome and not to let hatred rule in his life, but let love rule in his life, even though he had been mistreated, loving people, even though who had persecuted him. Indeed, Solomon showed what it meant to be meek and God blessed him eventually to marry and, and have a family and practice medicine in Chicago. The meek shall inherit the earth. There's a fruit of the spirit that comes by being meek. You leave a spiritual blessing and a legacy by being meek. Pride leads to a fall, but meekness leads to blessing and the fruit of the Spirit. And also meekness leads to that matter of being included in God's plan of redemption, that you are partners with God's people. You're not working against, but you're working in unity. There is citizenship in God's kingdom that is evident 
within those who are meek. They work together. Oh yes, there may be differences of perspective and approach, but there's one spirit that unites us all. And one citizenship through faith in Jesus Christ. The meek. Not only model this, but they shall inherit the kingdom as God brings that kingdom into focus in different ways through different people. And then we see Jesus says in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. There are blessings for the compassionate. When we hunger and thirst for righteousness, there is a desire, there is a compassion, there is something about knowing the heart of God that leads us to have a heart for one another. If we find that our compassion is waning, that means we need to get closer to the heart of God. And when we get closer to the heart of God, we also find that God will draw us closer to the heart of others. And sometimes by getting closer to the heart of others, it helps us likewise hear the voice of God speaking to us and working through us. God's care is for us to have hope and that our longings, as they're tuned to God, our longings for what is right and good and true and fair and just, these longings, this hunger will be fulfilled if we're seeking God and to live in God's pathway of righteousness, not our own, but His way. Our desire will be satisfied when we are walking in the path of God's grace and truth, for they will be filled. We will find satisfaction only when we're doing the will of God. And if one is not finding satisfaction, and then we have to, a person needs to take a look at where they are with God and the way that they're living. Of course, we should all yearn for, for what's yet to come. And none of us will find full satisfaction until the kingdom of God has come in its fullness. But there is a grace, a gift of God given to all who come to faith that will satisfy one's soul and give a deposit of the Holy Spirit that will help us hold fast and firm to what is right and good and true, that will bear fruit in and through our lives. When we think about people in our lives, who do you think about? Who has modeled this whole thing of being poor in spirit, meek? Who has uh, a hunger and thirst for righteousness? Who do you think of in your life? I think of a lot of different people, but I think of my grandfather, Forrest Gilmore. And I remember when he would come and visit with us, when we'd come and visit with him in New England, I remember how much he wanted to share Jesus with us. And not just, I want to tell you about Jesus and, you know, like trying to win us over by preaching the gospel, but by living it out, yes, mainly, by his example of kindness, by his listening, by his uh, smile and his laughter and, and having fun, and by his care for us. I think it really came down to his care and compassion for each one of us as his grandchildren. He had a care and compassion because he desired that we would come to know God through Jesus. To me, that was what it meant to be a disciple and he sharing his faith that we would become someday believers and disciples. He had the priority and the posture of humility. And yes, as a pastor, he understood what it meant to be poor in spirit. Not just that he didn't have much money, but that 
He understood what it meant to need God. And we need God. And he understood what it meant to go through brokenness at times. He mourned the loss of several of his wives. He mourned and was willing to share his tears at times with us. Even when he stood in the pulpit of First Baptist Church of Salem, Massachusetts, and thanked God for being in ministry to share Jesus for over 50 years. And he wept as he looked to family and loved ones gathered to honor his life. But he was humbled. And when he was at the time that it was time for him to die, and he knew this cancer that he had was going to bring about the death of his body, he wept thanking God for the life he had lived, for the Savior who had made a difference in his life. And I was privileged to be there so he could share his tears because he knew he was part and he had shared his inheritance of faith. And that his hunger and thirst for righteousness would ultimately be satisfied even though he could not see it from this moment he believed it believed in the resurrection believed in the eternal kingdom of god believed in his lord and savior who would come to take him when his final breath would come and he said please at my funeral don't think of it as a time to grieve as much as a time to celebrate, a time not of just memorial, but of a time of coronation, of hope and victory and assurance and comfort and peace. For indeed, when one humbles themselves before God, God is the one who lifts us up. Where are you with God? Where are you with yourself, with life? Do you recognize you're being poor in spirit and needing God or are you all self-sufficient? Are you your own God? I hope not. I hope you recognize that there is not only a creator God, but this creator God has come to us through Jesus Christ and this Loving Good Shepherd comes to us humbly and invites us into the kingdom of God. He invites us to inherit the kingdom, to repent, to believe, to receive the gift of God and his grace, that your hunger and thirst for righteousness is satisfied in him. He will satisfy your heart's desire. And the love that you so need is the love that he gives from God the Father, the love that the Holy Spirit gives to all who believe. My friends, the path of blessing begins with trusting God with humility. And it grows through service and compassion and is effective through truthfulness and perseverance. Jesus, lead, Jesus leads the way into a genuine and truly blessed relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. Pure discipleship begins with following Jesus Christ. Not only in name, but in heart and in actions. May we follow Jesus. Lord Jesus, we come to you. We need your help. We are poor in spirit. There's so much that we must confess before you. Our deficit is far greater than we realize, but the potential of your grace and of your redeeming power is far greater than our corruption. 
So, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Pour out, Heavenly Father, your Holy Spirit into our hearts as we recognize our great need. May you guide us and may we follow in the footsteps and teaching of your Son. May we seek after you and seek your righteousness and truth. And may we come and follow and serve together. All this we pray in Jesus' name and for your kingdom, gracious God. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus.